Hi, it's Ann, and welcome back to my 30 Days of Taiko Skills. Today is day 30, and I'm talking about Edo Kotobuki Jishi. It's the last video, and I want to make sure to thank everybody who's made a donation. Really, really appreciate your kindness and consideration toward this cause. Uh, doing a video project like this for 30 days uh, does take some time and effort, and I really do appreciate, appreciate uh, everything. Whether it's a donation or if you've helped me spread the word uh, online, social media, or otherwise, really, really appreciate uh, anybody who has uh, helped me with this project. So uh, thank you very, very much. So Edo Kotobuki Jishi, uh, I think it's probably uh, very fitting that it's on the last day because it's typically uh, celebratory um, associated with celebrations uh, in Japan in terms of um, what, we're, what this is known as shishimai. It's a general category of shishimai, which is lion dance. So Edo Kotobuki Jishi. Edo is the old name for Tokyo. Um, so this is the traditional lion dance of Tokyo. Uh, kotobuki means celebratory and jishi or shishi is the, the lion. Although technically, uh, shishi is not considered exactly to be a lion. It's more of a mythical creature that may resemble a lion and may have other uh, elements of other creatures in there. So if we just say lion dance, it may not be exactly accurate. Uh, it's probably better if we can all just say, say shishimai um, as a general kind of category. And more specifically, Edo Kotobuki Jishi, which is the Tokyo style of celebratory shishimai. And then more specifically than that, what I study and many others in the U.S. or anybody who has a connection to uh, Kyosuke Suzuki-sensei, my teacher, is the Wakayama Ryu Edo Kotobuki Jishi. Or the Wakayama Shachu uh, is the group that uh, Suzuki-sensei is a member of. And they've been performing this um, for a very long time. So, just to start, I want to, just like I did on the previous video for Edobayashi, go through some of the instruments and talk a little bit about the context of this. Um, again, the, there is a shishi. The shishi head is called shishigashira. And within the Wakayama Ryu uh, style, there's a certain uh, type of shishigashira with very specific um, features that... Uh, are, are used. And I don't, unfortunately, don't have an example here to show you. But um, if you go on my website, you'll, you'll be able to find videos and photos of um, the proper shishigashira for this. Of course, there's um, online, you can find Wakayama Ryu shishi, uh, shishimai performances that people have taken in public settings. So you may need to enter it in Japanese. And if you need help with that, please let me know and I'll be happy to send you links. So beyond the shishi, um, that's one person doing the shishi mai performance. And then there are three musicians. Uh, one taiko player playing two drums like this. So shime daiko and okedo. Okedo is like a barrel construction uh, type drum that's um, it's in the shime daiko category. It's rope tightened and quite a bit lighter than the shime daiko. Very thin body. So one taiko player would play this. Traditionally, um, they used to, uh, the shishimai troupe would go from home to home, especially during New Year's time, and go into homes and sort of as a ceremony or a ritual, uh, go in to purify homes. So there's this strong association with uh, the shrine and the shishi and the ability to... Um, chase away evil spirits and bad luck. So to me, the, the way we think about shishimai or just in general in Japan, shishimai is considered, I think historically it started as a ritual and more, more of a, a ceremonial purpose. And then it kind of gradually turned into this celebratory kind of uh, auspicious occasion type of thing. And then further probably progressed on to just pure entertainment. And um, the, hist the history really is that it, it's uh, 
represents the shrine. And depending on how uh, deeply you want to, to think about this and uh, pay respects to those roots, uh, there's all kinds of things that are involved with this music and this whole art form of how, uh, for example, how to treat the shishigashira properly so that you're, you're not uh, mistreating it or showing disrespect to this, uh, this entity that may have uh, ties to the deity. So it kind of depends on your approach and how much you want to go into that. But, but as a serious student of this art form, it's good to know this because it sh gives you the reasons why some things are done uh, within this art form, especially for the Wakayama Ryu version. Uh, I feel like their, their version is so spectacular because everything has a reason, and, and uh, a lot of those reasons come from this historical roots of having a kind of a ritualistic um, roots. And of course, it, it is entertaining as well to watch, um, and it is used for celebratory occasions, but the history is quite interesting, and it's something that, that uh, I've gone into depth with uh, talking with Suzuki-sensei, so I continue to learn more and more about that. So in those old days, the taiko player playing these two taiko, they would have it uh, strung around them and be mobile. Um, and later on, when it was more adapted to the stage, then it would be set on stands like this, and then the performers would either sit or, or stand on stage. So shime daiko, same as the edobayashi shime daiko. Okedo is a certain size. It's about, well, this is about... Um, nine-inch diameter, head diameter, um, typically around seven or eight sun, Japanese inch. Um, and then after that, we have the atarigane. For wakayama ryu, it's the same size kane as the edobayashi kane, the size 5.5 .5 betsubiki. Same beater, shumoku. And also the fue is the same as the Edobayashi um, Hosei Rokuchonchon, or 6.5. So, the um, inter one interesting thing about Edoba um, Edobayashi versus Edo Kotobuki Jishi uh, for the musicians is the biggest difference, of course, is the fact that there's a shishi, and that's the main, um, main part of what we're doing. So it's not purely music, it's also this extra shishimai portion. Um, and of course, there's this kind of balancing between what the shishi person is doing and what the musicians are doing. And there has to be a good uh, harmonious relationship between the music and the shishimai um, so that everything is goes smoothly and it can be perform to the maximum um, potential. And again, with Wakayama Ryu, uh, it's very specific. The music is specific. Just like in Edo Bayashi, there is a separate um, Edo Kotobuki Jishi Wakayama Ryu book, and it gives you the notation for um, the basic version for the taiko, kane, and fue. Um, it doesn't have anything to do with how to do the shishimai, um, that's something that you would, of course, have to go to your teacher and learn. Um, the music, too, you would probably have to go to a teacher and learn, but at least you have some reference material uh, from the book. And there's also, there's also recordings uh, by Wakayama Shachu members, uh, so you can hear what it's supposed to sound like. So it's interesting on its own as history. It's entertaining to play. Uh, it's it's an interesting experience to bring the music, that, especially the taiko, bring this back into the traditional role of being an accompanist instrument. So in this case, the, the taiko is not the main feature. It's the shishimai. And in this case, the taiko is trying to figure out how can I be the best accompanist to the shishimai and also to the other instruments, the fue and kane. Um, and it's, a, it's an interesting study to to figure out how best to do that. Uh, it does feel different than just playing a typical taiko-only show where the taiko is the feature. In this case, the taiko is, 
is an accompaniment uh, feature. So, in uh, of course, the the best way, of course, is to understand what every part is doing so that you can play together. Um, outside of just the fact that you're studying an interesting traditional art, I feel like something like uh, the Kotobuki Jishi Taiko part, for example, it's great to kind of get a good awareness of how to use multiple drum technique. So you have two drums, and um, there's very little improvisation. Pretty much everything is set in terms of which patterns to play or what kind of uh, notes to play. But within that, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of ways to interpret it and a lot of way techniques involved. So just as an, as an example, I'll play a little phrase of the beginning, yatai section. Okay, so you can probably hear there's inflection. The way we learn how to how to uh, play these rhythms is through this kuchishoga method, which I talked about on the very first day's video. Um, and there's different dynamics and different kind of inflection points. Um, there's different stickings. There's different. Uh, sometimes we play two at once. Um, I covered that in another video about flams, where you play two, two surfaces at once and we say jan. Um, there's these certain things that, that come up um, throughout the whole thing. There's um, ways to play two drums that I think is, is very, a very good study in terms of how to approach multi, multiple drum playing just in general as a technique. So that's something that's quite good. Um, same thing with the other instruments. Even if you don't play, um, even if you're not going to perform Edo Kotobuki Jishi, for example, on Atarigane, if you can play these patterns, you'll be able to play the kane in any other context and have a much better idea of how to be technically proficient and understand the role of the kane and how it fits into the taiko and the fue melodies. Okay, a lot of technique to have to develop to, in order to play this music on the Atarigane. And of course, just like Edobayashi, the fue is playing the melody. So all these things come together in support of the shishimai, and uh, yeah, it's a it's a very interesting thing. So probably the way it historically progressed from ritualistic to celebratory to entertainment, I think the way we as students progress is probably the uh, the reverse direction. So we might start getting into this and studying it because it's entertaining, and then we realize oh. It's used for celebrations, and it's for this purpose. So it's not just about the music, but it, there's a certain purpose and kind of a meaning that uh, shishimai performance might be requested. Um, for example, a company store opening or a birthday or some kind of a celebratory party. Uh, it's common. Of course, during New Year's time, it, it's very, very common. And beyond that, you get more into it, into your studies, and then we go deeper and deeper and start to understand the history and the reasons why all these things are happening. So I think uh, that's that's my has been my uh, trajectory of studying it uh, was, you know, kind of the reverse direction of, I think, how historically um, it's happened. So anyway, it's a little bit about Edo Kotobuki Jishi. It's a very deep uh, topic, and the only way to really know what it looks like and sounds like is to see the performance. Live would be the best, but you can also check out videos online. Uh, if you have any questions about it, I'm always happy to answer them. But 
This is the last video, day 30. It's also Halloween. Happy Halloween. And I hope you got something out of this series. Thank you once again to everybody who has helped me uh, with donations and helping to spread the word. And uh, I will hopefully see you on the next series at some point. Thank you very much.